So we'll begin. And as our friendly American has just mentioned, uh, we are recording this event this evening. Uh, so welcome to Bioluminescent Baby Collaborations and Publishing. My name's Sarah Campbell, and I'm the Associate Director for Arts and Culture at the University of Exeter, and I'm hosting this evening. So we have three wonderful speakers, a poet, a printmaker, and a publisher. And uh, they're going to speak about individual practice as well as coming together on this wonderful new publication. So I'm going to give a short introduction about each speaker, and then provide a bit more context about how the project came about, a few housekeeping, and then we'll get into the heart of it. So our speakers. Fiona Benson has written two full collections, Vertigo and Ghost and Bright Traveller, both published by Cape Poetry with a third due in 2023. Her work has won Ford Prizes for Best Poem and for Best First Collection. And the bioluminescent baby poem, Mama Cockroach, I Love You, was shortlisted for Best Poem in 2020. And hot off the press, it turns out there was a rave review in The Observer yesterday, so make sure you check that out as well. Anupa Gardner is an Indian-born artist based in Edinburgh, working predominantly in printmaking. Her work explores the ways in which we inhabit the world and our interactions with each other, nature, and the built environment. And in 2016, Luke Thompson founded Guillemot Press, alongside the poet Sarah Cave, publishing books by a broad range of new and award-winning writers, including Rosemary Waldrop, Robert Lax, David Harsant, Rebecca Goss, Tanya Hirschman, John F. Dean, Estra Papakristodoulou, Adam Marek, David Constantine, Jesse Greengrass, Karis Davis, and Patero Kalule, and many, many more. And Guillemot Press Books have received awards for their design, illustration, poetry, and publishing. So welcome to all of you. So how did we get here? How did, we, how did all this come about? So the University of Exeter has an arts and culture strategy and it's my role to deliver it. And what we do in everything is about joining stuff up. So uh, within the university, we work across staff and students to support their creativity. And we also make links outside the university. So we work with the cultural sector and creative practitioners, bringing them in, helping teaching, research and student experience connect up with those sectors across the Southwest. And within that framework, we have a strand called arts commissions. And so these are large scale, year long projects usually. Uh, they've run in a number of different formats. And we've worked with Fiona across a couple of these. So in 2018-19, uh, Fiona and uh, sound artist Maya Bosworth were one of three urgency art commissions that we ran that were exploring the theme of urgency. And Fiona and Maya were particularly interested in the world of insects and how we understand the world of insects and the dangers of shrinking biodiversity. So the idea was if we understand insects better and we get a view into their world and we get excited by what they are as creatures and the whole team in arts and culture was totally obsessed with insects for a very long time, thanks to this project. Um, we will appreciate them more and appreciate how much we need them. And uh, so Fiona's project was extended in 1920 for a year long, much larger project where we worked with Meyer again. And we also brought in sound artist Eliza Lomas. And we worked with a number of entomologists and in insect specialists, both at the University of Exeter and uh, across the world, academics uh, in the US as well. And Fiona ran a number of poetry workshops. And all of this came together in the end, uh, 2020 being the year that it was, we had an online launch of a digital resource called In the Company of Insects. And that has three chapters to it, where all of the poems have been recorded and you can listen to them in these wonderful soundscapes. So chapter one is Bioluminescent Baby, which has Fiona's poems and interviews with uh, entomologists and various academics and researchers, all in these very evocative oral spaces. Uh, the second chapter is poems that were written by adults who attended the workshops. And the third collection is a totally gorgeous uh, collection of poems written by children from local schools uh, about insects. 
So that wrapped our project uh, with Arts and Culture and uh, the poems have continued into their next iteration and their next life in this wonderful publication where uh, it's taken on a new shape, where Anupa has been brought in as the illustrator and Luke has led on the publishing. And that's really the center of what I'd like us to explore this evening is the idea of collaboration, where too often artists can be perceived falsely as kind of um, squirreled away in a garret somewhere. And it's a very isolated and individual experience. Uh, but from what I've seen is it's hugely collaborative where you have different skills coming together. And this is true of the sciences and the arts where you have different skill sets, worldviews, ways of working and making art and all sorts of different art forms is very much a group effort. So how does that work? How do we think about that and the push pull of that? So this evening, we're going to have some readings from Fiona and they will punctuate moments where we get to hear more about Anupa's work and Luke's work. And I have some questions for them. And so throughout, do please put questions in the chat uh, if uh, there's anything that occurs to you as we go. And hopefully, if I do my timings properly, we'll have about half an hour at the end where uh, all three speakers will come together and I can put questions from the floor to them. Uh, Zoom etiquette remains unchanged. Uh, so please keep your cameras and your microphones off. Uh, questions in the chat and uh, this is a respectful space. Uh, so please treat each other well, the panel and your fellow audience members. And as I mentioned, but just for those who are late to the room, the session is being recorded. So if uh, you'd like to remain totally anonymous, um, do please keep your cameras and mics off and feel free to change your name on the pen. So that's all the intro bits. Now moving to the exciting bits. Um, I'm going to hand you over to Fiona, who's going to read a couple of poems from Bioluminescent Baby. Hi, uh, good evening. Thank you for joining us. Um, and I'm, I'm just so grateful to Guillemot Press, namely Luke Thompson and Sarah Kay for this beautiful book and to Anupa Gardner for the, the gorgeous illustrations. Um, it's such a treasure, such a lovely thing to have. Um, and thank you. Um, I'm going to read, um, I'm going to start with Synchronous Fireflies, which is one of the um, poems that Anupa illustrated. Um, and Sarah mentioned the collaborative nature of this project, and that was really true. And it was so fun <laughs> to be able to go with Maya Bosworth, the radio producer, to research some of these poems. So for Synchronous Fireflies, we went to the Smoky Mountains and we interviewed um, one of the main um, experts on fireflies, on this particular kind of synchronous firefly in the Smoky Mountains. And it was such an incredible nourishing um, experience and way of making art. And I'm so grateful to the arts and culture team um, at the University of Exeter for making that possible because it really was joyous. Having said that, I was a little homesick when I was in the Smoky Mountains, and I'm going to read um, Synchronous Fireflies for Tynus Carolinus, which is dedicated to my husband, who I'm, I missed in the woods, basically. Synchronous Fireflies for James. I thought we'd be wreathed and gauzed, immersed, involved, as if the Milky Way swam through the forest and we were its shore. But it was more of a show. There was more of a distance, a fourth wall, as the fireflies displayed at the far side of the world in a complicated language I couldn't understand and wasn't meant for me. And I felt selfish and estranged. I'd come so far to see this thing and left you alone. But then the dark came down the hill at a soft pace with its quiet spell, like the lull between two lovers in a drawn bedroom. Not their speaking, 
but the quality of their attention, a thronged darkness into which you might send any thought and find it cupped and held. And though I came for the light, it was the dark that kept me safe. And though I wanted you for your beauty, it was for your gentleness I stayed. I should um, perhaps have explained that um, the, well, they're called synchronous fireflies, but actually it's not the actual flashing that is synchronized, it is the darkness, because the males need to pick out the females' weaker um, and static response to their light. So it's very important that there is a spell of dark in which the females can be located, which I found really interesting and which makes its way into that poem. Um, and I think I'm just going to do uh, one more. Um, I'm going to do one section of Magis Cicadas, which Anupa also beautifully um, illustrated. I'm going to do a slightly creepy bit, seeing as it's Halloween coming up. Um, so the cicadas, which Maya and I also went together to record, which was another wonderful experience. And we talked to Dr. John Cooley and Dr. David Marshall, who were um, chasing cicadas around and mapping cicadas in a car with a number plate that said Cicada One on it. <laughs> um, but while we were there, there were an awful lot of um, parasitized um, cicadas and they were they were quite creepy because they um, had their bottom halves missing, basically, and they're kind of cotton woolly in their in their abdomens and they kind of drag themselves along and they're being they're being controlled by this parasite and um, being made to move by this parasite and behaving in strange ways because of this parasite and there is something very very unnerving about them one of them just walked across the picnic table where we were sat doing the recording just walked in a straight line and then fell off the end it was very um uncanny so this is from magic cicadas and it's section six what sticks is that nasty piece head and wings the abdomen gone, thorax packed with hardened spores like a dense wad of cotton wool, dragging itself across the picnic table in a long straight line till it drops off the edge, automaton, the fungus intruding all its sticky feelers in the levers of its brain. The cicada scrapes its broken end like a dog with an inflamed anal gland, scooting its hindquarters over the ground, leaving its greys. It will wing click like a ready female to invite other males to copulate, to ram clean genitals into its floss. The fungus will sleep underground with the nymphs like a creeping dream. Infected specimens are tartly psychotropic if eaten. Their red markings are warning to the birds. It might just benefit the brood to be inhabited, infected, part sacrifice. Thank you. Thank you so much, Fiona. Uh, as you've just seen, I love the way that uh, nature is stunningly beautiful and fantastically disgusting. And uh, the beauty of Fiona's words to capture all of that glory is, um, you can see why the whole team was so intrigued by her work. Uh, and so now um, what we'd like to do is introduce Anupa's practice and give you a sense of uh, her work. And so Anupa, we'd like to invite you now to share your screen and um, give us some insights into your inspiration. And then I'll ask some questions from there. Cool. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. Give me a second. Um, Hoping everyone can see that. 
It's great. Thank you. Okay. Um, yeah. So, hi everyone. Uh, so, I am a printmaker and uh, illustrator um, and uh, an artist, I suppose. I sort of take on, um, uh, yeah, lots of projects in illustration, design, and education. Um, I thought uh, today, uh, yeah, I'd start with this, and I thought it would be appropriate because this was my Digby project. Um, um, and this is something, uh, it's a book that I designed, illustrated, and uh, wrote. Um, and I thought it would be relatable to your students, Sarah. Uh, so this is a front and back cover. Um, and it is basically based on uh, uh, homemade recipes that my grandmom used to prepare. And you know people from a generation would prepare uh, uh, at home uh, for common ailments. And so I sort of collected uh, 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 collected about 10 uh, very commonly found ingredients in an Indian kitchen, um, and then sort of also researched uh, recipes and remedies from them. Um, and so uh, this is one of the spreads from it. It also has a narrative running through it. Um, and uh, the narrative is basically about a grandmom and uh, her granddaughter and their relationship and their sort of uh, vignettes of um, what they get up to basically. So each chapter has a little different story to it. Um, and the main illustration that you see is a lino cut, uh, which sort of relates to the ingredient and then the pen and ink drawing sort of relates to the narrative. And uh, this is another spread from the book. Um, and then this, I also sort of created 10 sets of uh, postcards that sort of went with the book and each postcard sort of came with uh, a remedy with it. Um, so yeah, I should have sort of said I did graphic design uh, when in, during my degree and this is the sort of thing I would sort of produce. Um, so uh, once I uh, finished my education, I sort of continued to work as a graphic designer. Um, and I sort of did a lot of branding, corporate identity, but mainly to do with print. And at some point I decided I wanted to sort of move on. Um, and in 2007, I came to Edinburgh to do my master's in illustration. Um, I think I chose illustration because uh, I think printmaking or fine art seemed too scary at that point in time and illustration seemed a good middle ground for me. Uh, but um, yeah, so I think it worked out anyway. So this is a project I did during my master's. Uh, it's a book again, um, and it is uh, basically a, about my sister, who uh, the story is about her getting lost and finding her way back and the journey involved basically. Um, so these are two spreads from it. This is a colograph um, and then screen printed on top of it with some hand colored elements. Um, and as you can see from my you know, design days, I was really interested in print. And I think from this point on, I sort of veered more and more towards printmaking. And yeah, I sort of I would sort of call myself a fully fledged printmaker today. Um, so once I finished my master's, I taught at Winchester College uh, for a year. I taught printmaking, and this is something I produced at that point in time. Uh, it's a series of four. It's a lino cut um, uh, that's etched with, um, um, it'll come back to me, but it's etched and basically cut. Um, and uh, basically, uh, these are my students, um, and they were sort of having lunch. Uh, my work, based, the inspiration for my work sort of comes from the everyday, um, and I think from the ordinary, really. Uh, I think most of my work is quite experiential. Um, and uh, I think I really do enjoy uh, sort of uh, the mundane and sort of finding something special in it or sort of looking at some things that, you know, other people overlook perhaps and sort of finding the magic in it. Um, so this is a screen print, um, which was initially a mono print and then uh, made into a screen print, a two color screen print. Um, this is also a screen print and then a relief print on top of that. Um, so a lot of uh, my themes uh, of my work sort of come from uh, nature, from uh, family, uh, childhood, memory. Um, I think it sort of tends to be quite biographical, I would say. Um, this is a uh, set of etchings, three of them, um, and uh, it's based on my dad and his um, love for his cat, basically. Um, 
yeah, uh, he was one of those people who never wanted a cat and then, yeah, loves this cat. <laughs> um, yeah, um, so I do like, you know, most print techniques, but I think I really have a love for relief printing. And I think there's something really simple um, and, uh, yeah, just immediate about it. Um, I think also that, you know, you don't actually need a lot of equipment to make it. You, uh, yeah, you can sort of use a potato to make a relief print and it works really well. And I think because of the accessibility of it, I think it's wonderful. But also just the process of, uh, of mark making in it, I think is, uh, just it, for me is wonderful. Uh, I find it really meditative. Um, and I think just the object itself is just such a tactile thing. Um, I think all of that makes me just love relief printing. Um, so the previous one was a reduction lino, basically a full color reduction lino. Um, and then this is a five color screen print. Um, I think uh, while growing up, I was basically surrounded uh, by a lot of patterns, lots of layers, colors, textures, uh, just from, you know, uh, my uh, surroundings, I suppose, from architecture, from clothing to, uh, uh, to you know, vernacular art, uh, street art and things like that, to, you know, when you sort of go into temples, you see sculptures. Um, and I think all of that sort of informs my work, I would say. Um, this is a uh, woodcut um, on recycled ply. Um, I really enjoy you saying recycled things. I think, yeah, I, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I also wanted to sort of uh, uh, add some projects where I've sort of used print in. So this was a book for Jennifer Williams. She's a poet, and um, this is a, a yeah book cover that I made for her. Um, and then this is a collaboration with another poet called Elizabeth Reader. Um, and then this is basically my response to her uh, writing, basically. So this is a book about uh, loss, about illness and grief. Um, and I think uh, the images are basically choreographed and screen prints. Um, and uh, the images basically relate to, uh, uh, to decay. Um, there's a figure sort of running through it, which sort of blends into the background and, uh, and nature sort of takes over. Uh, there's also, I think, two sets of narratives going through this. The uh, bottom handwritten text is basically both Elizabeth and my account of, um, of uh, I think, either loss or illness. And then there's a uh, typewritten text which is uh, part of a manuscript, parts of it. Um, and then we sort of come to Bioluminescence Baby, which I worked with Fiona and uh, Luke with. Um, so I sort of created uh, four sets of uh, woodcuts for this. Um, it was meant to be a single colored uh, image. And so I thought, uh, uh, you know, the. Uh, uh, there's a certain graphic quality um, to uh, a woodcut, which I thought would work really well with Fiona's work, but also um, there's a rawness to a woodcut, which I thought worked really well with her poems. Um, so these are some of the initial sketches that I made for the, uh, uh, for the uh, before I sort of started cutting it. And as you can see, they're quite simple. Um, I think um, I, you know, because I like the uh, process of mark making, I sort of leave that to the end and it's quite a spontaneous process really. Um, and then this is basically uh, 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 one of the initial um, uh, sketches of uh, on the left. And then it, with relief prints, you always, um, it prints reverse and therefore you need to reverse it before you transfer it onto your block. Uh, which is what I've done on the other two images. Um, and then these are just different stages of me cutting away at the block. Um, and then that's the final print uh, for the Magic Cicada. Um, yeah, so just a short presentation by me. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, that's me. <laughs> um, I think Fiona has some questions, I think. I'm Thank you so much. Um, so yeah, there are um, a few things that I'm going to dive in on there. I, what strikes me just as an observation, when you speak about the magic of the everyday and 
you also get into big themes like loss and grieving. And what I love is that the arts covers all of that. You know, through the arts, you, you have a, a renewed understanding of something like a toothbrush um, or a cat sitting by the tally. Um, and yet you can also layer up ideas and themes and um, all of that exists within a single art form, which is so fantastic. So um, thank you for sharing such a broad range of work. Um, so please folks, if you've got any, uh, and there's a lot of love in the chat for your work. Um, uh, if anyone's got any questions, um, please add them and I will start off with mine. Um, so I'm really drawn to the way you use narrative in your work and you draw in your uh, family and these wonderful stories and you make artist books where word and image, they're two parts of one thing. You can't have one without the other. Uh, so how does the process of illustrating someone else's words differ from how you illustrate uh, for your own words? Um, I think um, with my own work, I don't think um, image follows a word necessarily. I think uh, there's a lot of back and forth really, um, and it tends to be a lot more fluid, I suppose. Sometimes it lacks boundary, uh, which can be difficult because you sort of, yeah, keep you know, uh, changing and uh, going back and forth. Uh, whereas uh, with someone else's work, uh, by the time it sort of comes to you, it's sort of gone through uh, so many stages and it sort of comes to you nearly at the final stage. Um, and so you're sort of responding to the word, uh, but also, uh, you know, when you're collaborating, collaborating with other people, uh, each collaborator sort of comes in with their own ideas and you're sort of working with all of that. Lovely, thank you. Um, uh, we have a, a question from the floor. Um, do you do a lot of composition sketches uh, before you decide the final one for printmaking? Um, is uh, it, does it vary? Uh, yeah, I think, I suppose with most things, you sort of do a lot of uh, compositional, yeah. Uh, I think composition does play a big part in um, the way I work, I need it to be perfect or not perfect, you know, as I want it, obviously. So yeah, I think I do do a lot of sketches. Sometimes you sort of cut them up and sort of, you know, place it in different places, uh, yeah, to sort of make sure you get it right. Does it always, I realize it's a very difficult thing to try to pin down, but that feeling of when it is right, when it's sort of resolved, is there just a point where you go, yes, that is um, where I, I want think to be. Sometimes that is difficult. Um, and I think uh, you need to sort of keep stepping back from your work. I think with printmaking, especially, and especially when I'm cutting my blocks, I find sometimes I overdo it. And there's always a worry that you do it. Uh, so I think every once in a while, before you sort of make a big decision, I always step back and sort of come back to it maybe 20 minutes later to sort of see, um, yeah. Um, because it's very easily done. And as you say with printmaking, you can't just put that little bit back on again, can you, once it's kind of... Uh, not in relief printing. <laughs> yeah. Not in relief printing, but I think in other things uh, to some extent, perhaps. Right. Um, uh, there's also um, uh, another question here from Jim. Um, you said that your work is quite biographical. Can you tell us about that amazing print of the musicians and the dog? Um, I, musicians I, and the dog. It looks like, was it a, an African influence? Oh, uh, actually, uh, yeah, I think it's actually you no know, more Indian. I think it's um, it's a, uh, it's basically a time when I sort of went, uh, it's in India, and you sort of go to these temples and uh, they have these festivals where these men are sort of almost in a trance and they're sort of banging away at these drums. And um, yeah, it was just magical. And there are these, you know, I think in India, because of the kind of country it is, you have animals, it's very inclusive of animals, I suppose, <laughs> in, uh, in its, um, yeah, I think even in terms of its myths and um, in gods and goddesses, there's so many animals that are part of it. Um, so you always sort of have a little stray dog or a cow uh, that are part, that's part of it. It sounds wonderful. You can feel the music and the movement of the image. It's, uh, it's lovely. Um, and um, 
I'm curious, when, when you start with a commission like this, when, when you receive these words and these poems, how, how do you begin? How do you get into the subject matter? How do you choose which works that you want to respond to? Um, you obviously, you know, I was given the manuscript and I read the whole thing. Um, and usually, you know, uh, with the words, there's a certain kind of mood and I'm sort of wanting to try and reflect that in my illustration as well. Uh, but you obviously do your research, you're sort of, in this case, as looking at all the specific species, uh, maybe, you know, the habitat that come from and sort of try and uh, do a lot of visual research as well. Um, and then um, I sort of start the process of uh, sketching, I suppose, and I'm sort of thinking of composition, I'm sort of thinking of uh, uh, what kind of challenges that the technique would bring. Um, and, uh, you know, I want the images to basically uh, be quite consistent in the way that they look. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I think you're sort of going through all of those things. Uh, in terms of, um, how I choose which uh, poem to illustrate, I think that was actually quite a practical choice. Um, I wanted um, the illustrations to be evenly paced within the book. I didn't want some to, you know, the front or the back, um, just a nice even thing. But saying that you still want to sort of connect, I think with all my work, I sort of have to feel that connection. Uh, without that, I can't make it because everything is very emotional for me. Uh, you know, most of my work, I think I have to feel that emotional connection. But that's really easy with Fiona's work, I have to say, it was just so beautiful. Yeah, yeah, thank you. It's, uh, and I, I um, can understand that sort of, if you don't feel it, what are you drawing on to, to create something? And that challenge of creating distinct images, but they're a family. Yeah. But I think that's another reason why I sort of moved away from graphic design as well, because it, yeah, I don't know, you're sort of just doing brief after brief, but there isn't actually an uh, emotional connection to what you're doing, um, which is, you know, there's nothing wrong with that, but I, I think I just needed that in my own work. Um, and um, so just to make um, a note, Jackie, I will come back to Fiona with your question at the end. I haven't, I've seen it, I haven't forgotten it. Um, uh, Anupra, I wanted to the way you speak about printmaking is lovely, that it sort of, it snuck up on you, that you sort of started with graphic design illustration and the lure of printmaking kind of caught up with you. And, and I think of it as being this very highly technical, you need a lot of kiss and, and you speak about potato prints. And so yeah. you can actually, anybody who has this love of printmaking, there are very immediate yeah. ways in. Um, and I'm, with your process where you start with the sketches and then they get translated into the print. Um, one is a additive process of drawing a line and the other is a subtractive process of removing the space. Um, are you in a different headspace for those ways of working? Um, yeah, I think with, yeah, I think with each technique with printmaking, you need to sort of be in a different headspace, I feel. Um, with relief, uh, it is a reductive uh, method um, and you're sort of taking away to sort of make your image, whereas, uh, you know, while you're drawing or painting, you're adding on. Uh, so, yeah, definitely. Uh, I think with printmaking, it sort of just slows your pace down to some extent. Uh, it sort of makes you, because certain things have to be done at a certain time, it makes you quite mindful and very organized, I find. Um, and I think it's really meditative, to be honest. Certain parts of it is very meditative and then other parts of it is really physical. And then there are parts of it you just get mad at and you're like, ah! Um, and so you get a whole range of emotions while you're printmaking. <laughs> With huge satisfaction at the end. I'm sure uh, sometimes, not always, but I think uh, that's also exciting because sometimes you don't know what you're going to get and uh, sometimes the mistakes are just great. Yeah, that's true. Rooms for happy accidents are uh, wonderful in there as well. Thank you so much. Um, it was Thank wonderful. You. And we will we'll loop back around uh, to you. Um, so Fiona, I'd now like to invite you uh, to come back and share um, a couple more poems with us, please. 
Hi, thank you. It's so lovely listening to the discussion and also very reassuring about the spacing in UPA because <laughs> I was thinking, you know, you could, this is silly, but you kind of think, oh, well, why why didn't, why wasn't there an station for Mama Cockroach? <laughs> so it's actually really good to know about the spacing, funnily enough. Um, I'm going to read uh, Marmalade Hoverfly, which uh, Anupa showed us the image for earlier, um, her absolutely beautiful woodcut. Um, and this poem, again, was strongly collaborative, and um, it was Dr. Carl Watton and Will Hawkes on the um, Cor Cornwall campus who um, researched marmalade hoverflies for their migratory patterns. So what I hadn't realized was that, you know, flies migrate as much, you know, we know about certain butterflies, the monarch butterflies undertaking these huge migratory journeys. Um, but actually there are vast hordes of insects that do this and the marmalade hoverfly um, is one of them. And um, the reason, one of the reasons Dr. Carl Watton and Will Hawkes are researching this is because um, they bring such an enormous bio service with them because they're massive pollinators and uh, also their larvae eat aphids. So they are altogether wonderful. And um, I think Carl Watton and Will Hawkes are both a little in love with <laughs> hoverflies and it was very infectious. I think um, they've been very endeared to me. I'm always noticing them in the garden now. Marmalade hoverfly. To understand, in part, their migrant flight, made each year at speed and funneled through this mountain pass in torrents that defy all estimate. We net and pick out hoverflies on sight, glue a pin to each specimen's back and suspend them in a simulator. They spin giddy for a second on their axis, then align and strain, their wings an urgent blur, veering only to recalibrate. Take minute readings of the sun in its heavens, make fractional adjustments to their course, intricate celestial navigations that dwarf all human skill with stars or sextant, unerringly defining south. They point their brittle bodies towards a warmer meadow across the thousand miles where their young will thrive and do not hesitate or falter. When we dissolve the glue and let each one go, it is a bright needle gleaming in the compass face of morning, a drawn thorn, a Pentecostal flame, disappearing fast, then gone. How my own soul tugs at its leash and strains towards my children, all of us compelled towards whatever we think God. Call it the fierce insistence of our own genetic code. Call it love. And I'm going to read uh, Mama Cockroach, um, which um, doesn't have an illustration, but is... Um, Beautifully disgusting, in my opinion, <laughs> the cockroach. So <laughs> um, I hope you enjoy this. Mama cockroach, I love you. Because you cozy with the aunties in your reeking slums and are intimate and sweet. Because you begrudge no one a meal, but ooze a fecal trail to lead your commune to its source like a dirty bee. Because you are joyfully promiscuous. Because you pouch your young and hide them in the sweaty creases of the house near superating food so they'll hatch to a feast. 
or keep your eggs with you in a special purse shaped like a kidney bean and clutch it fast or reinsert them into your abdomen and womb them there or carry them as yolks and give live birth then feed your pale brood secretions from your anus or your armpit glands like milk or deep in the flesh of a rotten log, pass them a bolus of pre-digested food, mouth to mouth. Because you suffer your young to swarm upon your back and do not flinch or buck them off, but carry them like a human playing horsey with her children, down on hands and knees, decrying the swag of her own loose flesh. Because you twirl your antennae gracefully to test your crawl space, because strokingly you caress your offspring's backs and gentle them with pretty pheromones and chirps. Because you purr when your young stroke your face. Because you would leave your body for your offspring to dine upon. All the liquors and gravy of the obscene world. Your work in the crannies delivered to the living. Because you are, despite all rumours, mortal. And what if you are crushed before your eggs can be delivered? What if your sisters drive you hissing out? What if your kitchen is fumigated? What if the mongoose, the lizard, the snake, a muscular tongue prying at the warm and greasy interstices of your stubborn occupancy takes you in its mouth? Someone must care for the dirt. Thank you very much for joining us. And I just wanted to reiterate my thanks to Guillemot Press and Anupa for making this beautiful book and to Sarah Campbell and Naomi Glanville and Anna Bunt and Phil Rushworth and Clive Betts and everybody who made this um, possible in the first place, gave me this time and um, a way to research that was immensely nourishing and wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much, Fiona. Um, I think Mama Cockroach is, and there's a comment there as well, how um, you can see an insect in a different way through Fiona's poems and uh, I share what I do with my mum in New Zealand and uh, bless her, she's a good mum. She reads everything that I do uh, through work and, um, and she loved Fiona's poems. And I think that sort of the impact of this, she was telling me that when she was gardening, usually when there are flies around, she kind of shoes them away and, and sort of um, gets quite grumpy of them. But after reading these poems, she was like, no, everything has its place I'm going to appreciate insects in a new way and just taking that moment to think about everything big and small having its place and um, uh, it worked on my mum and I'm sure it's working on you now uh, so for our third speaker this evening we're uh, joined by Luke um, so co-editor of Guillemot Press and uh, so Luke you're going to share with us um, some insights into your practice and how you work and then I'll ask you some questions and everyone do please any questions you've got in the chat and I'll loop back around to anything I haven't picked up yet when we have our chat at the end. Thank you very much Sarah. Um... I'm really glad that Fiona left on that one that we said was wonderfully disgusting with the the uh, liquor was it liquors and gravy um, that we've seen and also it's really nice to see I'm, I'm, I'm glad Anupa shared um, those process pieces the pieces uh, the, the bits of the work uh, as as it was being made because that was one of the sort of privileges I suppose of being uh, the publisher of this is seeing it from those very first sketches and uh, this is the first um, this is the first time I, I think I, yeah, this was the first time I worked with Anupa from scratch, um, so to speak. So seeing it from 
uh, those very early sketches and seeing how it developed into something so precise and perfect. I just put one, put, uh, my copy behind me of one of the prints here. Um, they're really, really beautiful. And I should say you can buy them. There's only, I think there's only about 12, um, 12 prints left, maybe fewer, maybe 10 or something like that now, but you can buy them through the Guillemot website. Um, if you, or you can have a look at them all actually through the website too. Um, so I have not got as, as attractive and beautiful a presentation as Anupa has, uh, but I am in a room surrounded by books. This is sort of the Guillemot headquarters. It's, um, I, can, I can move maybe six inches each way and the rest is sort of um, uh, waist high in boxes and um, multicolored tissue paper. There's a little letterpress printer just over there. Um, there's lots of lots of uh, bits and pieces surrounding me here. Um, so yeah, I just want to talk a little bit really, I want to, well, thank you everyone for, for coming along. Thank you, Sarah, for, for organizing it and everyone else who's involved. Um, and thank you especially for inviting uh, us to talk around or towards the theme of collaboration, um, which is something that's been uh, kind of at the heart of uh, the ethos of Guillemot Press, I think, from the beginning, we've worked with, we like the relationships that we build and we like working with a range of, of people. Um, and I think uh, collaboration is something that uh, as a, an especially small press, we're a tiny, um, we're a tiny press, we get to make uh, a lot of the decisions that bigger presses or individuals within bigger presses don't get to make. Um, so I we feel, I think, uh, uh, quite a strong part of the uh, making of this a uh, specific iteration of a text, um, which I think was a phrase that Sarah used. Um, so I thought maybe I would just introduce Guillemot Press very quickly um, and uh, maybe show some of the books that, that we've done uh, this year. This year really has been a year of collaboration for us. We've had more uh, collaborations, uh, uh, different sorts of collaborations this year than any, any other. Um, although, like I say, collaboration has been at the heart of Guillemot from the beginning we've worked with uh, writers and artists together from our very first year um, and I, but I think it's become a bit more sophisticated we've learned a lot along the way of, of how we want how how these collaborations or how working together um, is best facilitated I suppose uh, to make the best final object um, so yeah Guillemot Press we are a very small um, publishing company. We publish mostly poetry. We started out actually publishing fiction, um, but we've moved towards towards poetry over, well, very quickly, actually, within a year, we were getting far more poetry submissions and of, of like tremendous uh, quality right, right from the beginning. Um, so yeah, it's our fifth, we had our fifth birthday in March this year. The first book we published was March the 11th. And uh, I remember that because it was the centenary of the writer that we were publishing. So it's the centenary of the birth of Jack Clemmer, and we published a short story by him. So that was our initial statement. It was, was in short fiction, um, followed very quickly by a little book by Sister Mary Agnes with the artwork of Gary Fabian Miller, um, which was the, the, I feel the one, it was the one that really, uh, it was the title that really stimulated us to, to create uh, Guillemot Press and it's the book where we really started to to figure out what we what we were doing like we, we started to see what we were doing using different materials and how they how different sort of materials interact with different kinds of printing um, over the years we've done all sorts of printing we've done we did riso printing where we hauled these giant machines um, uh, across the Port Elliot sites across fields to get to a tent in the middle of the Port Elliot festival and uh, we worked, that was a huge collaboration between um, John Kilburn, Ben Smith, uh, myself and about uh, probably about a dozen, I think, students um, creating a daily newspaper for a festival from scratch. So we did the writing, the printing, um, and we, we'd start at sort of nine in the morning and finish after midnight. Um, it was great fun. Uh, so we've done Rhizo, we do, we've done Litho, digital printing, um, letterpress printing. We've done all sorts of, all sorts of uh, productions over over these few years. Um, and we focused mostly on short forms. We wanted to focus on short form fiction, so short stories, uh, individual short stories and producing uh, lovely pamphlets out of them. Um, and short form poetry, which is usually called pamphlets. So we kind of test the boundaries of what a pamphlet is. Uh, if you look into uh, say competitions or prizes or um, other publications that 
the public, uh, uh, sorry, are the publishers that produce pamphlets. You'll see pamphlets defined as something that's either under 36 pages or under 40 pages or under 24 pages, um, uh, depending, on, depending on where you look. And uh, we kind of take those and quite often make them into huge books, uh, like um, this one actually is, is uh, probably, I think it's about 60, 60 pages or something like that. Um, and just make a, a really big occasion out of them, I suppose, by um, the design, by sometimes playing with artists and, and illustrators, bringing in other people to, to, to uh, play with the text. Um, the short form of poetry has always been something that I love. Um, it was the first uh, thing that the first book that I published of my own writing, but I didn't publish it, it was published by Atlantic Press, was uh, again a collaboration, uh, an artist collaboration, which was called The Clearing with these. Um, lovely photo uh, sort of installations by Marae Dunn, who's an Irish artist, um, absolutely beautiful work she created. And when I got my, had my first collection out last year, um, I asked Marae if she wouldn't mind um, uh, lending an image for the cover as well, which was, which was lovely. But the short form, um, so as a writer and as a publisher, it's something uh, I really love. I think it's a different sort of discipline to um, other forms of poetry publishing. I think, um, and writing. So I think it's a different discipline as a writer and and as a reader as an, as, a, as a publisher. So I think as uh, these short forms there, um, they give the writer sort of space to to see through an, an an idea of some sort, whether that's a theme like bioluminescent baby and the insects, or whether that's um, a form. So one of our earlier books was Martin Crucifix's uh, Oh at the Edge of the Gorge, which was a crown of sonnets, um, which I don't know whether who needs that explaining, but a crown of sonnets is, um, or this form of a crown of sonnets was, I think it was 14 poems, uh, obviously 14 lines to, to each poem. And the last line of the first poem becomes the first line of the second poem, and so on through the book until you get to the end, when the, four, the last line of the last poem then becomes the first line of the first poem. So it's got this sort of crown, this circular element to it, um, which we then wanted to play um, with when we came to designing it. And Philida Blumel, an artist who we've worked with on a few books now, came up with um, a brilliantly impossible design uh, that um, ended up causing all sorts of trouble at the printers uh, with the paper stocks and the, the French folds and all these sorts of things. It was great fun to produce. Uh, from, from from our perspective, they're not not from from our printer um, who lives in sort of the village down the road from us. Um, so, yeah, short forms are, are something something we absolutely love for the, these reasons. I think they're tightly defined. Um, it's they really lend themselves to I think uh, interesting and involved designs to be, trying to trying to create um, this this whole this this sort of event out of the, this this very tightly. Uh, structured and defined uh, series of poems or or, or a story. Um, and yes, we, we we like to bring in artists and illustrators. We don't do it on all of our books. We've done it. We do, I think, on about half of our titles at the moment. Um, the first one we worked with Anupa on or was actually another collaboration earlier this year, which was Second Memory by Pratusha and Alicia Per Mohammed. It's a little hardback pamphlet um, printed on really interesting uh, i can say things like interesting paper stock and not be over not not mean this ironically i find i find papers very interesting and i can be very boring about them um feel free to ask me about the environmental impacts of our paper stocks the, the um these ones were made from um uh waste recovered waste from various uh, agricultural processes this one was made from corn we've got another one from the wine making process and there was one that was made from dredging um the lakes of Venice, the particular algae to use to make the pulp. So it has really, it has a negative carbon impact basically. Um, so we look a lot at materials and those sort of production values. That's that's really how Guillemot, um, I think has got uh, uh, any reputation it has is for, for these sort of high quality um, um, productions in, we look very closely at the papers we use to match them with the sorts of prints or illustrations or texts that we're, we're playing with. Um, so I mentioned earlier, and I'll just end on, on showing a few uh, of the books. I mentioned earlier that this was our year of collaboration. Um, we have seen various forms of collaboration. So there's artist and writer collaborations. There's the, the collaborative element that we bring to it as we think about um, design production, the Guillemot iteration of the text. Um, and there were also collaborations between writers, and we've seen three of those this year, and they work really, really um, 
differently. But they worked really, really differently. So Pratyusha and Alicia per Mohammed's second memory was you can't completely tell who's writing which bits. There are clues within it. Like it came as a whole piece. Um, similarly, actually, with the Clarissa Alvarez and Petro Kalule Marsh River Raft Feather, which is one we've only just um, published, it, it's it, it's it's really dynamic. Uh, an interesting, uh, interesting text. Um, you can see a few pages of that on the website if you want to have a look. And we also had one that was sort of collaborative in some forms, which was Phoebe Power and Katrina Cortius's Sea Change. Um, and part of the challenge with this one was to um, to bring their quite different poetic and stylistic approaches um, to the same landscape and the same uh, commission from the, Na uh, the National Trust. Uh, and bring that together into a sort of coherent whole. And so that I, I worked with the artist Rose Ferriby on this. Um, Rose is a uh, longtime collaborator. Actually, we worked with Rose on our like fourth book, I think, in 2016 or into 17, maybe, which was Men Only Challenges, The Tender Map, which won the Michael Marks Award for illustration for Rose's work. And Rose has become a very good friend. And it was Rose also who introduced us to Anupa. Uh, and Anupa's work some time ago, so that Anupa's sort of been on our the Guillemot radar for a while, and we've wanted to work with her. Um, and uh, we're really lucky to to have come across um, Bioluminescent Baby. Just as you know, it, it was it was felt like exactly the right project to start this um, to start this collaborative relationship. And I think we, well, we are working on some other projects together as well. Um, but yeah, so Rose Rose brought this um, beautiful. Uh, um, see change together with these collages, these really striking collage images. Um, Rose we worked with on I think three or four books now and there will be even more um, uh, coming up in the future I'm sure. Uh, one of the collaborations, pretty much all of our books and collaborations, another artist and writer collaboration was uh, The Other Body which is only just come out by Flo uh, Reynolds and designed by Philida Blumel. It's got this cover which uh, it's about, it's, a, it's another bug based one really, and so it's got this design that includes these um, these pages having been eaten away as though by by the bugs and it's all in the, the um, it runs throughout the whole, the whole book is being devoured by snails and slugs and all sorts of things that are being talked about in the in the book. So yeah, so it's, it, it felt very, very timely to be invited to talk uh, around the theme of collaboration tonight, bearing in mind the sort of year we've had. We've had our biggest year yet uh, of, I think we've had 14 titles out, the final, uh, probably the final one of 2021. Um, we've just had back from the printers this week, actually, uh, or last week, which was Litanies by Norsh Sabah, which will be launching in the middle of November. Um, and it's been such a big year of, of, of collaborations, uh, uh, writer collaborations, artist and writer collaborations, um, that it feels really, really appropriate um, and lovely to be here uh, talking with you all, all about it. So I'll, I'll, I'll hold off there and um, um, I'd love to hear any questions or thoughts about the text later, including actually, I'd love to see, hear Fiona's response to having your work illustrated, because we, we found as publishers that it's, it's one of the sort of closest readings your work will ever get, um, is the reading that the illustrator does, and it's really fascinating to see what they pull out of the text. Luke, we will, I'm saving that one. We will, I promise. Um, uh, you're not off the hook quite yet. Um, I, what struck me when you were speaking is um, like, when you're holding the finished product in your hand, you can enjoy the weight of the paper, you can enjoy the textures and the finish to it. But all of those decisions are buried, I think. There must be infinite decisions with it. Well, no, ultimately finite decisions with every publication that you make. So many ways, every single publication could have gone. The decision for the chewed cover or the decision for the layout or those combinations or um, whether the paper is algae from Venice um, and how all these things have to come together. And it must be sometimes just a bit overwhelming or is that where the fun is, is navigating all of those choices? I really enjoy it. I really enjoy seeing what's appropriate and what will work and testing out those um, those things. I, I do spend a lot of time looking at paper. A lot of the books behind me here are paper swatches, basically. Um, you yeah, know, I absolutely love that part of it. It's, 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 there are lots and lots of decisions. We're, we're actually um, really lucky in that because most printers um, wouldn't wouldn't let us play the way we do. We, we have um, worked with uh, other printers before and they, they have sort of set 
um, paper stocks, for instance, that they that they bring in, uh, and they won't, you know, they wouldn't go for a a, a paper that's made from Phoenician algae um, for just a couple of hundred copies or 500 copies or whatever it's going to be because they buy paper by the ton. Um, whereas we work with a very small printer just down the road. We, we spend a lot of time there and talking to them on the phone. And he's, uh, so it's Roy and it's his partner and their son um, run, the, run the place. And, uh, and they, they, you know, they, they indulge us. It's, it's quite a, a common thing for me to say, can we do this? Uh, like there's a pause and you know the face he's pulling. Um, and then there's well, it's possible, but you know, and then we figure it out. And um, uh, yeah, some of, some of that's shaped by the artist. Some of it's shaped by by us as we design. It depends on the book. The the one that I showed you with the cover eaten out, that was the uh, artist designer. That was Philly's. Um, that was Philly's idea, and it was one where we looked at it and thought, we've never done that before. How do we do that? And um, we figured it out. We got there in the end. It's a lovely. It's a lovely worldview. We haven't done that before. How are we going to do it? you know let's make this happen um uh there is a question from trish um what is the time frame from submission to publication yeah it's getting longer and longer for us so um it was probably fairly short to begin with uh would have been within within a year i'd have thought and i'm not sure I'm pretty sure it isn't now um so we've only been going five years and we, we're doing more and more titles each year that we're going to have to scale back because this year has been Bit has been a difficult and it's been very busy to get to to, to figure it all out um but we're now looking at we've we've had um uh, the past year we've had about a thousand submissions of poetry coming in um so that's a lot of reading and that very quickly takes you you know if you're only meant to be doing eight or ten books a year that's you're upsetting a lot of people uh, <laughs> all the time so so the and but you're getting such good ones like we're getting some really really interesting uh, work come in from lots of new writers as well as uh, more established writers and um so yeah we're having to work a little bit further ahead at, um between submission and publication at the moment i suppose uh well we're not taking submissions but we're, we're looking at 2023 now 2022 has been full for some time um and we try we, we're not really encouraging submissions just at the moment while we kind of catch up on um, on what, what we've got still sitting around mm. waiting for us. It does uh, lend itself to a question that I wanted to ask, um, uh, where in one of your biographies, you talk about your interests uh, being biography, human-animal relationships, environmental literature, poetry, and Southwest writers. And it seems that Guillemot, the kind of um, identity of Guillemot, has all of those elements in it and I'm curious you mentioned collaboration as a key part of the ethos for you and Sarah um could you speak a bit more about how you're developing a kind of a feel Guillemot Press I, I think you, you're in only five years you're at a point where people could recognize a Guillemot Press book so there is there is a consistency in the way that you're working so how do you guys um how have you developed that brand and ethos um so I think yeah so I think we've we've got um, I think we've got on the website a vague theme. We've got our interests, and they're quite enclosed interests it, 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 in a way. Um, it's not sort of formally defined or or uh, well slightly thematically defined. We've got we've got particular interests that that we felt weren't being fully um, represented. Or we'd like to see them foreground. We'd like to foreground them ourselves. And th those were the sorts of books we we've um, been working on. So that does include. Um, I guess something I said, said quite early on, not tonight, but rather in, in the life of Guillemot was um, writing sort of um, beyond experience, writing towards edge lands almost, beyond what can be said. So that has room for like uh, linguistic experimentation, for instance, and we, you mentioned Astra Papa Christa Dula, and I'm really sorry I gave you that name to try in the, in the build up. Um, try typesetting as well, we had to do it over four lines. Um, um, so there's that sort of linguistic uh, experimentation for people like Astra, people like Rowan Evans, um, that's sort of trying to say what can't be said in a way. And some of the human-animal relationship stuff, I think, and some of the bits and as a writer I'm writing about now is human-animal communication uh, and language, um, I think I think lends itself to that as well. So it's, 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 it's all rooted in our interests and our interests are fairly uh, fairly well shared happily. Um, the, the early text that interested us, and it's something that, so Sarah's been doing her PhD on poetry and prayer together, and one of our first books was uh, on Sister Mary Agnes, I think I mentioned it before, a book called Harvest with Gary Fabian Miller doing the, uh, his photography. Um, 
and that that's a book by this um, nun, uh, a nun poet who is in the Poor Clare orders in North Devon, actually. Um, and and she was writing this sort of mystical, erotic poetry, and you weren't quite sure where the physical and the spiritual, um, uh, you know, which was which, um, where one ended and the other began. And it was that was what was really quite potent and powerful and surprising about it. Um, so yeah, it has it has just born out of our been born out of our our personal interests. Um, I think they cohere just about. Southwest writers doesn't really come into it very much. We we honestly have. A, I don't think we've done very many, although I don't realise I've mentioned three tonight alone. Um, I think the past year has been quite a lot of Scottish or, or Scottish based or at some, at some time people who've been in Scotland. Uh, uh, had a, a lot of writers from, from there, so we had Jen Hadfield and Rhea Sledmere. And um, I think when I first was talking to Alicia Bermahawi, she was in Scotland too, um, possibly Pratusha as well. So yeah, there's quite a lot of, um, <laughs> it's, so the Southwest bit isn't so much of a definition, although I think some of the publishing practices of the Southwest have, have informed us, which um, places like Atlantic Press were, who pair, uh, they do the opposite from us. So we usually start with text and then we work the artwork around or into it. And Atlantic Press have always started with the artists um, and then the, the, they pair the artists up with the writer, so to speak. So it's kind of the opposite way around, but they've had this sort of process of working with both text and image that was really informative, I think. And I think that's something that we've done quite well down in, down in Cornwall. I know for, the past sort of four or five, about four or five years in a row, uh, the Michael Marks Award for illustration, so basically for book production and illustration, has been won by um, Cornish um, Cornish publishers. So it was Matt Osman who was a part of Atlantic Press, and it was Atlantic Press, and then we had it twice as well. So we kept it in Cornwall for like four or five years, I think. So um, there are those influences, but in, within the Southwest. Um, I'm not sure if I've answered your question, but I've talked around it quite a lot. You have, you have, you've, you've drawn out the way that you think about um, how you guys work. And um, uh, there's a question from Trish here that, that links. Um, uh, so she asks, um, can and do publishers collaborate with each other on projects? Uh, is question one. Um, and are you open to hearing from new illustrators? Uh, should they be interested in you? Um, okay, uh, so the second question first. Um, it's always nice to hear from people. We're We've, we've worked very sort of organically with artists and illustrators in that they, it tends to be sort of um, friends, friends of friends or, or people who um, we've met within a certain network. Um, a lot of the artists that we've worked with have come through through Cornwall, through uh, there was a degree or there is a degree called, that was called something like MA Authorial Illustration down in Falmouth that, and they were producing for, for, for quite a number of years some really, really outstanding artists. Um, and illustrators who look, who read texts differently. They had sort of workshops with poets about reading texts and um, and they were just producing some some stunning work. And, and I was working around there at the time. So I kind of met up with a lot of them. And then Rose was someone I met while I was, I was studying at Exeter actually. And uh, we were both doing PhDs at the same time. And uh, so Rose Ferriby was then introduced to people like Anupa. And so this sort of word of mouth of, of people who would be nice to work with, that's something I should have really emphasized about Guillemot is a big part of it that, you know, this is very small press poetry publishing. There's no money in this. We're not, <laughs> we're not, we're, we're not doing this for the cash. You know, it's uh, so for us, it has to, we love it. We really want to do it. And each project is part of, how we think about the writers, art, the writing arts we work with, we want to enjoy. It has to be fun, or there's, you know, there's not much point to it. We, we really want to enjoy every project that we're working on. Um, so yes, we're interested in hearing, but we're not particularly looking for new illustrators at the moment. We've got quite a good uh, a group that we're, we're working with on several projects uh, at the moment. And then can and do publishers collaborate with each other on projects? Yes, they can. And yes, they do. I guess not very often, just because it's like a lot of these sorts of jobs where people are so pre so hard pressed for time. Um, we've with the Alicia Per Mohammed one and Pratusha that has been published uh, simultaneously. So there's sort of it wasn't full collaboration, but it was um, kind of working together to one another schedules uh, because it was published by a Canadian publisher while we published it over in the UK. And we were sort of I think we were all looking at one another's productions and thinking, oh, we've got to make this one a really good one to make it sort of as good as theirs. And they make absolutely beautiful books, too. Um, we have, I guess we've worked with other publishers, um, and we've talked, we've done a lot of talking about working with other publishers, probably more talking than we have actually, actually collaborating. So there was a, a festival recently that was a sort of, um, small press collaborative event, uh, that was led by Bad Betty Press, um, who are another good fun small press. 
and yeah there's 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 those sorts of there's those sorts of things happening we've been talking to we've been talking to lots of publishers about it i'm sure there'll be more coming there was a lot of conversations just before lockdown and that's obviously made made things um covid's made things a little bit different um for, for working together and working on events particularly oh thank you um and i'd like to ask you one more question and then we'll get all of us back in the room um, uh, you whizzed past one of your own um, publications. Um, and so I'm interested in your perspective as a writer and a poet and where that's advantageous as a publisher, having that understanding, I suppose, a bit like a direct director. Um, and, or perhaps are there sometimes where it, that can make things harder somehow? Yeah, um, I think it makes, I think it's really good to have both perspectives because I think writers expect something of publishers and publishers expect something of writers and they don't always match. Um, so I think, I think that helps a lot. Uh, it helps me to know what sorts of things a writer might be looking for, particularly, particularly new writers. Um, I mean, I, I know as a very small press, we can't match the sort of publicity that Fiona would get at Cape or, or writers would get at Picador or Penguin or, or Simon & Schuster or any of those places. Like, we just don't have that machine behind us. Um, but I think there are other things that can be really useful and that I'd have liked to have seen with some, with some productions on some small press production I've done too. Um, so we do try to um, get other commissions. So we do push festivals, which I don't think a lot of publishers do. It's normally an agent's job, I suppose. We do um, push some festivals and events because we have connections to them naturally um, to, to sort of take on. We, we usually give a sort of list of people who might fit whatever themes they've got going and see if people are interested in what, what works. Um, so yeah, we're aware of those sorts of things that would be really nice and, and launch events. It's really good to have launch events. It's not always possible. We were doing events, quite a few events up in London, um, for a while, uh, at Chain of Books, a bookshop up there that, was, that were working quite well. Uh, and, um, and we were, we were connected to Bob Memorial Poetry Festival down here, um, which had, uh, funding, good funding. So we were able to sort of bring poets from all over the place, uh, to, uh, together sort of you, to do launches or to, to, to give a platform and um, so those sorts of things are really fun when, when and I think really helpful for a writer um, uh, starting out giving them a little bit more of a platform so I think that stuff is is helpful um, but that obviously the downside of that is that it's much more work than just um, making books. <laughs> That's lovely thank you um, so if we could have um, uh, our lovely tech Andrew, if you could bring Fiona and Anupa um, uh, back into the room. And um, so I'd like to start by asking Fiona, how does it feel to have your poems illustrated so beautifully? Oh, it's, well, it's just been amazing. Am I? Yeah, no, I'm not muted. It's been, well, firstly, I mean, I knew Gilly Mott did beautiful books, but this is so, it's so beautiful. I don't know, um, there's a shiny foil hover one of um Anupa's hoverflies on it and uh you open it and there are these end papers I mean there's just there's a playfulness to that as well that I really enjoy I think I love the end papers I think they're so gorgeous and then Anupa's um woodcuts it it felt quite uncanny looking at them actually because they are so like how I was seeing things in my head. So um, the synchronous fireflies, this, you know, when I close my eyes and think about a firefly forest, I think Anupa pretty much nailed it. And the same with the marmalade hoverfly, like this kind of very direct, but slightly monstery hoverfly. It's just, they're just, per they're really perfect. And I haven't, you know, I haven't had the experience of being, oh yeah, and the other, you know, the cicada, that's just, that's just like, all the cicadas in the trees creeping everywhere and shouting their heads off. I mean, they're just so accurate to what I had in my head. Um, and I haven't been illustrated before. And um, I haven't, I mean, I love my, don't get me wrong, I love my Kate books as well. But this is, this, um, this is kind of more of an art house production, I feel. And it's also just so lovely to be part of Gillymot. So um, the first time I came across Gillymot was at a reading in the middle of nowhere. Um, and it just, Gillymot just has lovely, uh, friendly 
feel to it as an you know Sarah and Luke but and also the books just feel like a family of books they do and so it's so lovely to be part of that and to have this it does it feels like um an artwork Anupa and uh, it's such a privilege it's such a privilege to have had you work on these and I think Luke's right about it being the closest reading I'm ever going to get and I do suspect that Anupa has some gifts of telepathy and um okay, your words Fiona you know, um, uh -huh. you know, your words <laughs> thank you Fiona that's a lovely description and the the serendipity of finding like-minded souls and their importance with collaboration where um having worked a number of collaborations of, over the years you're looking for those moments of chime and alignment and spark where it all fits together so beautifully and doesn't always happen you know that's what everyone's always aiming for but when those moments when it does land it's just wonderful um, um Anupra I wanted to um uh, ask Eleanor's question um uh how so Anupra you spoke about printmaking as accessible uh which Eleanor really loves and the use of recycled materials uh so her question is uh what tools or materials would you recommend to someone wanting to try out the art form um I think uh, relief printing in particular, I think, is quite accessible um, because you can sort of use any material really uh, as long as it's flat enough um, and will, yeah, to sort of uh, that you can sort of roll your ink on. You could sort of make it out of cardboard if you like, just cut up bits of cardboard, stick it on another piece of cardboard, ink it up, and then hand print it. Uh, but at the same time, you could sort of use things like uh, lino, um, which you can get off your kitchen sometimes. Or I've used bits of chair to make prints, you know, uh, broken bits of chair. Or, yeah, you sort of get so much, uh, uh, you know, apply just from packaging and things like that. Um, and you need to just get yourself maybe some cutting tools um and some ink and you sort of get water-based inks as well so you don't need to use oil-based uh so they're much easier to clean um yeah um i don't know if that answered your question <laughs> um but yeah you can sort of yeah and do try potato printing or or even just with little erasers you could sort of cut into erasers and sort of make yourself a beautiful block printed pattern Thank you from Eleanor. Fiona, were you going to say something? I was just going to say I love the idea that everybody's going to be pulling up their kitchen lino now to make and smashing up chairs. It's brilliant, Anupa. <laughs> um, and I should note this would also be a good moment to plug if anybody would like to have a go at printmaking and lives near Exeter, Double Elephant Press are doing a series of printmaking workshops. Uh, taking inspiration from Fiona's book. And there are still places on tomorrow's session, um, Poetic Letterpress with Jeremy Speck. So um, Double Elephant Press, um, their website is where you can book. Um, but swinging back around, um, poetry and printmaking and publishing, I'm sure for many people are like, where do you start? How do you even kind of, get into the industry? How do you kind of get that footing and, and build from there? So if I could ask each of you in turn, Fiona, Anupa, and then Luke, um, what are your top tips for building a career in these spaces? And perhaps another way of coming at it, what, what do you wish you'd known when you were starting out? What kind of helped you find your way? Uh, Fiona. That's a huge question. You know, when I was listening to Luke I, I talk about the Guillemot Press, I was thinking about how he and Sarah have really approached it as, as artists. It's been about all about what they wanted to make, hasn't it? And I think um, I think that's the only thing you can do as a writer as well. You just make what you need to make. And I, um, you could spend a lot of time worrying about your career or you could just go and make something. And I've yeah I think I don't and also there is really no such thing as a career in poetry because like Luke said there really isn't any money so you are doing it for the love of it so if you love it love it and get on and make it that would be yeah I'm afraid that's my career advice nobody's going to hire me as a career advisor Sarah yeah <laughs> No, that is not true I, th I think authenticity follow your passion is um 
very sound advice and um yeah thank you uh Anuka. that's a much better way of putting it be authentic and follow your true self yeah um um well i suppose um you know as a printmaker well you you know if you're sort of going through your normal um uh, university or something like that where you're actually surrounded by people uh, who are so skilled uh, and there's so many technicians who just know so much and i think i would sort of tell you know ask all your questions so to engage with these people and yeah uh, learn all of that because it's really difficult to sort of try and find spaces later on to do this um, but also at the same time once you leave university I found it quite difficult to sort of find um, a print workshop um, but until I sort of came to Edinburgh uh, but then if you're uh, if you're close to a print workshop I would say join it because it um, you get a really wonderful community that comes with it um, and you learn so much through that as well um, and I think I've got so many friends through this uh, community so yeah uh, join a workshop a printmaking workshop uh, or a studio that's a great chat lovely thank you um, and Luke yeah um, yeah there's lots of different angles to this aren't there um, Fiona said it was a big question and I liked the was mentioning about being surrounded by people and community because I think um, part of what the question might be asking is about being published um, um, and I suppose the advice I'd give there is, is uh, I mean there's lots of advice about approaching publishers and all that sort of thing but also being present like being turning up to events and talking to people um, being remembered being memorable always helps um, I think it's, it's quite a practical, but not, uh, not um, and that, I mean, that was one of the things I'd probably have done a bit more of and, and something we miss sometimes a little bit in Cornwall and it, um, is, is that, that sense of, be, of being surrounded by people. But when you do get in the room down here, it's with the artists and um, that's how we found all of the great artists that we've worked with is by, by being with these um, brilliant people uh, in the room and talking to them, seeing their exhibitions, turning up to events and and, and doing events and um, so so yeah that would be the advice I'd give to young writers I suppose wanting to be published um, but I, I I wouldn't put that over um, what Fiona was saying about loving it and just doing it and enjoying it um, uh, I think we've all said it now poetry isn't you're not in it for you're not in it for the money there's very few people I think doing only poetry to earn a living in the UK certainly um, and usually they do all sorts of other things like uh, um, I don't know about everyone else, but I'm doing about five jobs at the moment in, in different different fields, all related with books. I'm doing some lecturing, so teaching about publishing and teaching about writing. And um, I'm doing some editing for other publishers, um, but I'm doing a book on Cornish classics for Macmillan. Um, so you just, and, that, and, and that's only coming about now after years of sort of um, really chipping away at things so I don't think I don't think I did feel like I'm the right person to answer how to get into it with publishing it was different like it was just a question of not being afraid of jumping in because there was a lot of time where I was thinking I don't know how to typeset a book I don't know how to print a book or manufacture a book but I know I want to so just sort of saying okay I'm doing it and we'll figure out a way and and it was sort of lots of small um, moments of getting close to um uh to uh, getting close to to being fully committed like opening a bank account in Guillemot's name and, and uh, until we got so far that we had to do it, we had to, we had to make some books. Um, so, uh, so yeah, that, I, th I think getting, in, getting into publishing was, was um, finding a definition, I suppose. And um, I think possibly if we're thinking about what we'd have done differently is looking for funding, as a small press, looking for funding from quite early on would probably have been useful for us. Uh, we've kind of deliberately not gone for funding, but that's, um, uh, got its strengths and got its weaknesses but I think starting out that's probably quite a useful thing. Um, mm. The um, uh, Luke and Anupa you both speak about community and also uh, others you know help from others I think there's something about I don't know how to do it somebody does so they can help me figure out how to do it or say yes to something and then figure out how to do it and I've seen that so many times where you don't know what opportunity is going to come next until you've taken that first step into the unknown and you step out and then more opportunities arise and then you step out again and more opportunities arise and you can't see any of those from your nice safe 
space. Um, it's always that kind of pushing forward. And after a while, you can then trust, just got to do it, something will come. And, uh, and it does, um, like some small miracle. <laughs> Um, there is, uh, we're, we're just up against time. Um, there was a, a question from uh, Julian, um, which I think is for Luke, but maybe for Anupra and Fiona as well. Um, do you come upon many people who work through print and poetry? Uh, and uh, he's thinking about David Jones as a model here in particular. How often does that happen? Um, <clears throat> um, speaking specifically to something like David Jones, I'm not completely sure. Um, but there are lots of people working in print and poetry, they're in a very different way. I'm thinking of people like uh, Thomas A. Clarke um, uh, up in Scotland, who makes um, prints and wonderful concrete poetry, really, really interesting um, writer and artist. Um, who else? I mean, I mentioned Astra Papa Christa Dooley. she's not just print and poetry, she's all sorts of objects and, and resin and, you know, anything. She, um, it's, if, if you can Google, Google her name and see what she's up to at the moment, it's always really fascinating. Um, <clears throat> so there are quite a lot of artists working in, I suppose a lot of the ones I'm thinking of work in um, what you might call visual poetry, they, they tend to be crossing over. More traditional actually, possibly more in the David Jones is someone down in Cornwall called Matt Osmond, who works in prints and he makes pretty much like, like Tom, uh, Thomas A. Clark makes his own books um, as well, I think there, there are a few people coming out of those sorts of courses who are making their own books. Matt Osman does it especially well. Um, he admit, yeah. Um, but so those are a couple that spring to mind. I'm sure there are there are there are loads, but those are a few. Maybe maybe a new pool now if you actually. I'm not sure. Lovely. Thank you. Um, so we're against the clock. An hour and a half flies by when you're having such a lovely time talking about art. Um, so. Um, Quick reminder, Double Elephant uh, Press uh, workshops. There's one happening tomorrow and there's one on Sunday with Dry Points. So do please check out their website. Uh, if um, you'd like to keep in touch with Arts and Culture, please join our e-newsletter uh, where we uh, every month will overwhelm you with how amazing the cultural scene is across Devon and Cornwall. Um, and just to finish, if you'd like to um, uh, show your applause in whichever way suits uh, to Fiona and Anupa and Luke for their just gorgeous presentations this evening. So if you want to turn your cameras on for um, uh, Applause or applause, whichever applause is your preference. Um, thank you so much um, for sharing your work with us this evening. It was it was wonderful. Thank you. You gotta get my my shiny applause. Lovely. Thank you very much, everyone, for attending. <laughs>